So it's that guy there, codeproject.com, okay? By the way, I hate Apple Macs. I'm getting rid of this one here, but there's only one thing that I like about it, and you'll see it during the presentation, and it's this here, look. <laughs> okay, so um, my background is in uh, very large enterprise systems, um, and recently in data engineering and big data, um, and search, um, and getting things to scale. Um, but it's important not to do just the one thing that you do in work, and it's important to keep growing. And one of the things that's always fascinated me has been robots. And uh, uh, so this, this talk, it's about the craft of engineering, because engineering is not just something you go to school and you learn and you finish. Engineering is a craft. You keep learning all the time. Um, and it's about stuff that I wish I knew 20 years ago. Um, some little words, and if you take away one thing from today, um, I'll be happy about that. So it's about lessons learned, and it's about building stuff. That's the important part, it's about building stuff. Um, oh, and robots. So robots are important too. So, um, I grew up with robots, and you see these funny pictures now, um, but this is actually what we saw back then. We thought that robots would be something strange and weird, and we didn't think that actually they were uh, more going to be industrial robots and um, uh, robots on the web and stuff like that. Here's some robots that I grew up with. Uh, everybody knows these guys? Star Wars, yeah? Okay. Um, does anybody know Johnny Five? Okay, right, Johnny Five. Johnny Five was one of my favorites. Um, people know that Johnny Five was in this particular movie here, but you may not know that when he finished his movie career, he went on to become Pope. So, <laughs> this is Pope Johnny. And I, for one, welcome our new overlords when they come in to take over the planet. Um, some others that I grew up with that uh, always were in my head were these guys lost in space. And they were funny because, um, you know, I'll use my thing again. Um, 20 years ago on TV, we hadn't got a lot of really good um, special effects and things. So they improvised. And you looked at stuff, then you went, whoa, this is cool. And now you're going to go, hold on. This is a bunch of guys wrapped up in kitchen foil. <laughs> it's kind of strange. Um, and I was, was slightly fascinated with this guy, even though he's a bit of a, a twerp, because um, he had red hair. Um, apart from when you get older like me, if you're Irish, you get red hair. So, yeah. um, my favorite, absolute favorite robot of all is Chappie. Has anybody seen Chappie the movie? Okay. He is a gangster robot. He is absolutely badass. And if you only see one movie this year, if you download one movie illegally, make it chappy, please. Right. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, so um, I've always wanted to be able to, to build a robot. Um, and when I was probably about 17, um, one of my summer jobs was cutting the grass with the lawnmower. And I've become quite an expert at cutting grass. Um, and I always thought, you know, there's got to be a lazy, an easier way. And um, when I was growing up, my father used to say something to me whenever he'd say, cut the grass. And I'd say, oh, Dad, please. And he would say, laziness, did I ever offend you? <laughs> so laziness, did I ever offend you? And from an engineering point of view, it's really important to be lazy. Because when you're lazy, you think about smarter ways to do things. You think about not being busy all the time, but you think about ways of making things more efficient, and that's really important. So I wanted to build a robot, but I'm a software guy. And software guys don't do hardware, because hardware is hard. Yeah? I mean, <laughs> um, but I do fix lawnmowers. <laughs> and I'm kind of good at that, and other stuff around the house, and I'll give stuff a go. So hardware is hard. I'm just going to take off my watch so we can keep an eye on time here. One sec. So hardware is hard, or rather, it used to be hard. It was hard. It's not that hard anymore. And when I built my first computer, I was probably 10 or 12 or 13 or something like this. And um, uh, you, you put the things together and you hoped it worked, okay? Now, even as a seasoned engineer, if I was my dad, who was also an engineer, 
and um, I put myself back then in his shoes, and he was, let's say, you know, 45 or something at the time, and he built this computer with me. He plugged things in. He wasn't sure they're going to work. So now we have this thing of plug and play, but back then it was literally plug and pray. So we would pray that the damn thing would work, and if it did, it was a minor miracle because there were so many things that could go wrong. But engineering has really moved on since then. Um, and this was my first uh, computer. It was a Sinclair ZX80. And um, if you can, I don't know if you can see that, but the, the advert said it's going to satisfy your lust for power. And the power that this machine had was, it was a ZX80 chip running at 3.25 megahertz and had an expansion pack of 16 kilobytes. Think about that for a minute, 16 kilobytes, yeah? Um, when I got my first big IBM computer, it was uh, uh, absolutely huge, it was stonking, cost me about $3,000 at the time, and um, it had a massive, massive, massive hard drive. It was 100 megabytes. <laughs> and I split that into 10 drives. <laughs> I had one for games, one for programming, yeah? So things have moved on. That, by the way, as the sign says, it's not a microwave. The way that computer computer worked was, um, this was the, the PC. You had an old cassette deck that you plugged in. Um, and when you turned on the computer, it didn't know it was a computer. So you had to tell it. So whenever you wanted to play a game, you had to type your games in by hand first from a piece of paper. So this is actually how I learned to program, by typing games in. Because every time I wanted to play a game, it took me two hours to write the damn game to actually play the game. It was a bit strange. So, um, the other interesting thing about the ZX81 was that um, uh, it was revolutionary at its in the time because um, it didn't have uh, a screen built in, okay? It wasn't like the Apple Lisa or one of these things. Um, and everything was multifunctional. And strangely, um, because it was so efficient, and this was um, tweaking the very, very last piece of juice out of this machine, it was so efficient, that every time it actually wanted to write something to the screen, to display, the machine had to pause. <laughs> so the machine actually stopped working for a microsecond while it displayed onto screen. And it had all sorts of different um, multifunctionality like this. So not to have a separate keyboard, we had a, a keyboard that you had to do this with about 10 times. So every key had about 10 different functions. So, Hardware was hard. It was really hard. So let's talk for a second about convergence. Does anybody know what convergence is? It's the coming together of different things. Okay, Convergence is the coming together of different things. And here's some people that over the years have brought me to talk about my robot here today. Um, first of all, uh, Eben Upton. He has that little guy there. Everybody knows who this is, yes? A Raspberry Pi? Everybody knows? Okay, good. Um, the next guy, uh, Guido, who wrote Python, fantastic scripting language. And the cool thing about Python is that you don't have to be rocket science to use the damn thing. You don't need Visual Studio. You don't need big enterprise systems. You just need a text pad, <laughs> okay? So it's useful, it's a great hacking language. And then lastly, this um, uh, lady up there called Lady Ada, and she um, started a company called um, Adafruit, and they started making these devices and plugins um, that you could plug onto things like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, etc. Um, and suddenly, what was just a computer became that much more. It opened up for us. Here are some things that brought me today, the, the journey that brought me here today. Um, so I saw a tweet about this particular uh, product by um, Asus, and they said, hey, our new robot was launched today, it's called Zenbo. And I said, oh, that's kind of cool. And you know, you click on a tweet, and you go to the tweet. Um, by the way, if you're ever trying to work and get something done, you have a deadline, don't go clicking on tweets, because one tweet leads to the next tweet, leads to the next tweet, and Jesus, your time is gone. Um, I actually finished this presentation three minutes ago in the hotel, <laughs> because I clicked on a tweet. <laughs> so, um, that was uh, Zenbo, and that was really interesting, and um, I didn't think a huge amount more about him. 
Now, I subscribe to a mailing list called um, Hackaday. And it's not for, oh, we're going to hack a computer or black hats. Hackaday is for electronics hacking. And it's about um, how can we put everyday bits of stuff together and make something useful? How can we create with electronics? And in that, in one of their um, uh, posts, they were talking about um, a pan and tilt motor. So pan, or, um, yeah, tilt is this way and pan is this way. So um, one thing connected to another in my head and they went, oh, so this robot guy that kind of rolls around on wheels and his head does this stuff, that's actually how you do it. And um, then I said, hmm, interesting. And I had one of these Raspberry Pis, because when the Raspberry Pi 1 came out, I said, that is so damn cool, I've got to have one. So I ordered five. <laughs> <laughs> and then guess what happened to them? They sat on the shelf, gathering dust. I made a media center, because when everybody gets a Raspberry Pi, they make a media center, okay? And that was cool, and it just sat there, and nothing happened. I said, I'm gonna do something with it, I don't know what, and then the Raspberry Pi 2 came out. <laughs> I've got to have some of that shit. <laughs> so I went off and I got some Raspberry Pi 2s. And they sat on the shelf as well. And then the 2.1 came out. And I said to myself, I really have to do something with these because otherwise I'm going to end up building a cluster of Raspberry Pis to do like micro supercomputing or something. So I went on to Stack Overflow. And I typed in the question, how do you build a robot? <laughs> and it came back with a couple of cool things. And the great thing about Stack is that you can ask some pretty short questions and it'll give you some pretty concise answers back. You never get a deep dive on Stack, but you do get some good links off to other places and that's really useful. And it led me to, um, among other places, into GitHub where I found some libraries in Python for doing this with a pan and tilt motor. And I realized, oh, actually, it's just two servos, one that does this and one that does this. But actually, they're exactly the same servo, one is just on a different plane. This is all, they just do the same thing, up and down, on and off. Yeah? So it's actually quite easy. And then I went off and I broke down the project in my head and I uh, came up with a concept and I wrote an article around the, con the concept. And then it got syndicated and it went off down to um, C Sharp Corner. And then eventually, I got an email from um, Thomas who said, come and talk about this robot. <laughs> so that's why I'm here to talk about this robot. So today's message. Today's message is that um, when you start getting gray hair and you go bald like me, okay, you don't know everything. In fact, you realize you know very, very little, extremely little. But what you do know is you know where to go looking for things. And this is the most important thing. The most important thing is not what you don't know, it's that you know you don't know it, but you have a rough idea of how to find your path. So it's about pathfinding. Engineering is about pathfinding. So let's learn some stuff about that. So here's the thing. I'm just a software guy, and all I know is software, right? And in software, we have functions and we have APIs. So I can spin up a thousand virtual machines. I can make a machine take in natural language and convert it to speech. Um, I can do all sorts of wonderful stuff like this. But I can't do hardware, because <laughs> it's hard. Right? But I can fix a lawnmower. But the thing is, this Raspberry Pi thing, it's actually just a computer, right? That's all it is. And it runs Linux. And that's an operating system. And it's built on functions and methods and APIs. And guess what? It's got this little route to the outside world. And this little route allows you to connect to things and to stuff and to control them. So actually, the hardware world is nothing more than an API. And that was this like, bang, in my head. Bang. <laughs> that was cool. So I thought, if I can fix one of these guys, yeah, if I can do a lawnmower, well, by heck, I can build a robot. <laughs> this will be fun. How hard could it be? So does anybody here have knowledge of 
how to fix a lawnmower. Hands up the first person who can fix a lawnmower. Okay, there's a hand over here. Since you can fix a lawnmower, you want to contribute, guys. The stuff getting given out here. <laughs> Who put that hand up? There you go. Um, that's a really cool kit. Does anybody know what um, a, a hen's tooth is? You know a hen, right? Like a chicken. That's a hen. Does anybody know what a hen's tooth is? It's rare. It doesn't exist. So they say that when something is as rare as a hen's tooth, it's really rare and it's difficult to get. Those things are very difficult to get, <laughs> so you're lucky. Okay, so um, let's digress for a second. Um, and there's, we're going to start hitting some uh, lessons here now along the way. Um, one of the things that uh, I do is I read an awful lot of different things. And um, I have a lot of interests in different areas. But that's kind of cool. There's a watch here. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Um, I have interest in a lot of different areas. And I read about this thing a while back called a Benford distribution. And it's a thing in data science that says, um, for some strange reason, whenever you stack up numbers in a particular way and things are done, um, they always follow a particular curve. And that's what that curve is there, that red curve, Benford distribution. So if, for example, you go off with your credit card, and you start buying stuff. This is weird, okay? You start buying stuff in your credit card. If you go off to your credit card um, uh, summary statement at the end of the month, and you add up all of the first digits of all the things that you have purchased, and then put a count on each of these first digits, they will follow this curve, right? That's what they'll do, they'll follow this curve. And this is one of the things that's used in the fraud detection. So when they want to find out has somebody actually committed fraud, are they um, swiping a credit card, they actually see, do, does it follow this natural human pattern? Does it follow Benford's distribution? And if it doesn't, they go, bang, this is a stolen card. So why is that interesting? Um, I was doing uh, some stuff in web scraping a while back, and I was being constantly blocked and stopped. And it turned out that the reason was they didn't think I was a human, because I was doing it too frequently. So I was out of Benford's distribution. When I actually rejigged my algorithm to make it come back into Benford's, distri Benford's distribution, suddenly it started working. And it's remained working ever since, scaling hugely, thousands and thousands of instances. Um, so the lesson here is that be aware of different things. Don't focus on your own single domain that you're in. Read widely and look at everything, because it's bound to have some kind of impact down the road. Things just come together. So, um, scratching an itch. When you're an engineer, the cool thing is, um, you get business guys. And um, how many people here know a business guy who's going, oh, I've got a great idea, um, it's going to be the next Facebook. Huh? Okay, right. So business guys have no clue. They really don't. And you kind of go, yeah, right. <laughs> so the thing is, when you're an engineer, you get these itches, but you can scratch them and you know the scope of what you can scratch. You know whether you're going to dig in, you're actually going to create a big hole in your leg from scratching, or whether it's actually just going to take the itch away. So you know exactly what's going to go on. Um, anybody here play TF2? No prizes. Okay, <laughs> let's look at Zenbo, right? Um, so uh, we're going to try and zoom on here now. Zenbo, I'm going to put the mic down here so you can see what he does. And from this, let's see if we can figure out how we could reproduce this. Oops. Hang on. Does it go okay, so Zenbo moves around. That's the first thing, okay? He spins around on wheels. So how does he spin around? It's a servo. Actually, it's a group of servos, and you'll say, well, this one, uh, move that direction, or move that direction, and he moves, okay? So it's an API, you can tell him how to move. Um, his face, any ideas about his face? Anybody tell me anything about his face? It's a mobile phone, it's just a tablet, okay. So, you're invited to an exclusive meal with the speakers. <laughs> Gotta talk about people. <laughs> so, that's what Zenbo does, right? Um, let's look at some other things that he can do just to get quite a bit of an awareness. If I can get this one going.
not is not going properly. That's okay. So um, the bottom line is that uh, he does. Um, oh, we're going to we're going to restart the program. Okay, so the quick lesson about that one there is that when you observe what you're trying to do, you observe what you're trying to build, think it through carefully. Don't just go, well, that's cool. Break it down into little steps and try and figure out exactly what's going on. And importantly, think, one, think ahead, right? Look over the cliff. Think ahead 100 times and say, what could possibly go wrong? What could happen? You might want this today, but what do you want in six months' time, in two years' time? Did um, uh, Zuckerberg ever think when he was starting off that he would have one of the world's biggest cloud clusters. No, he didn't. He actually wanted to hook up with girls. So think ahead about what you need to do. Okay, so um, reverse engineering. Um, you know, if we look at decomposing numbers, right, we see when we're learning to add, we start off and go one, one is two, two, two is three, three, three is four. But there's a better way to actually do math in your head, yeah? So we can break down numbers, we can add them together in different ways. And likewise, when I was looking at Zenbo, I was thinking, how do I break this guy down? So, as my friend said, rightly, he's got a camera for his face. There's a reason for that. Um, he's got a touchscreen face that we can interact with him. He's got a microphone in the front. He's got this pan and tilt servo thing. Um, he's got speakers in his belly. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and he's also got some sensors down the bottom for proximity and safety and moving around and that kind of stuff. And he's got actually um, two wheels. That's all he has, two wheels to move around. So when you think about it, it's actually a reasonably simple thing. So once we know how it works, the next question is then, how do I improve it? So we identify the parts that are there, the linkages, the interactions between these different things, the power they're going to take. Um, does it do this? If it doesn't do that, why doesn't it do it? Is there a particular limitation? Um, how has it been done in other domains? So is there another area of engineering or science or um, any kind of uh, uh, life that this particular thing has been done? And if so, can we copy it in? So for example, um, if we look at, um, uh, I don't know, a uh, hummingbird. How does a hummingbird um, uh, stay in the one spot? all the time. How do they stay in one spot? Anybody? It's actually that they rotate their body. So you know a hummingbird, right? A hummingbird, a little small bird. And... Oh, no. Has anybody seen the Simpsons episode where you have uh, Apu, the guy who has the uh, quickie mart, and he drinks too much um, slushy? He's going around like a hummingbird all night. Yeah? So the same thing, a hummingbird. It stands there, it sits, and it just does this. It hovers. And this was the, one of the inspirations um, for uh, the original stabilization within drones. Okay? So looking around, you learn these types of things. Look to different domains, that's very important. When we break it down, we see what does it actually do? It's got autonomous movement, just obstacle avoidance. It can communicate information, it can comprehend. 10 years ago, this stuff here was really, really difficult. You couldn't do it. It cost tens of millions to do this. Now, you can go to your local electronics store, you can buy bits for $100, and you can put this together. Sure, it won't be as pretty as Zenbo, okay? And we do like pretty, right? It won't be as pretty as Zenbo, but it's really functional, and it does exactly what you want to do. So, the lesson here is that even if you know about something today, come back in a year, or in two years, or in three years, and most likely, something will have happened to allow that to move on. Deep learning is an absolutely huge example of this. Deep learning 10 years ago was nothing. It was a, a dead-end uh, area of science, of computational science. Nobody wanted to go into it. In fact, you were considered stupid if you went into deep learning. Why? Because it required too much processing power. And then suddenly we had the cloud and we were able to harness all of these unused cycles and suddenly deep learning is actually coming to its fore. So it's really important to look back when you're looking forward. Okay, so the motherboard. Um, the 
motherboard is the central hub of our uh, device. From a Raspberry Pi here, it allows us to talk in and out. We've got um, USB connectors, we've got audio out, we've got um, a GPIO, which we'll talk about, um, and we have a HDMI connector. There's everything there that we need to connect to our screen, to hook into sensors, and to send signals in and out to be able to move around this robot. When we want to get to the outside world, we use this thing called a GPIO, which stands for General Purpose In Out. And the idea is, um, it's a bit like, um, who has heard of webhooks? Okay, so webhook and API, the idea is, is that with a standard old school API, you would pull it, okay? You would say, give me some stuff, give me some stuff, give me some stuff, give me some stuff. Because this is polling or pulling. With a webhook, what you can do is you can say, when does it change, I notify you. So it's pushing. So it's the same as on your phone, right? You're, you're walking around there, da, 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 mind your own business, the next thing, bang, something notifies you. There's a tweet, there's a text, etc., etc. It's pushed the message down to you. So this is the way the GPIO works. It allows you to send information out and pull information back in. Remember, it's a computer, it's hackable, and it's cheap. So therefore, you can afford to mess up. Now, I talked about stuff only being an API, right? And this is important. How many people here have done some hacking on CSS or websites or web pages? Yeah, okay, so most of us have done something like that. And let's have a quick look at that. In CSS, if we want to turn something on and off, we can just say display none. It's a simple thing. To turn an LED on and off, using let's say a bit of Python, I'll just zoom in. This is all we have to do. Pin dot right low, pin dot right high. It's an API, and guess what? An LED will light, or it'll turn off. So we've actually magically interfaced with hardware. So the lesson there is that things are the same as what we know, but they're slightly different, okay? And all you've got to do is just go that little step further and you do it. So the GPIO, what we can use it for? Um, we can use it for hooking into all sorts of different sensors. And this is a pack that you can pick up for um, I think they're selling for about 30 or 40 dollars on Amazon at the moment. Um, and it's all sorts of experimental sensors you can get. This one in particular is really good. It's owned by a group, a group in China called Sun Founder. Um, and it's got everything there from a sound sensor to a rotation sensor, um, flame sensor, so you want to go and burn your robot, it's go, oh, don't burn me, I don't want to die, etc. Um, it's got gas, joystick, alcohol sensor, very useful, okay. If you want to know if you're too drunk. <laughs> So, robot gets scared away. So, if you go beyond this here, once you, you kind of go beyond the equivalent of, um, uh, oh, I can build a media center, right? Once you go beyond that step, and you go beyond this here, then you start getting into the realm of really interesting, obscure electronic sensors. And you can start doing incredibly cool things. And the power in sensors is not what they can do on their own, the power of a sensor is what it can do when you put it together with other sensors. That's really important. So, some quick explanations about sensors. This one here is an accelerometer, okay? So, when you're uh, going from here to there, um, and let's say you have, um, oh, bugger. I showed up my phone in my pocket. And the reason is I use one of these um, walking apps. It's called Pacer. So, it tells me how many thousand steps I've taken in a day so I can get my belly down, okay? So I don't look quite like Santa Claus. <laughs> so all my pacing is going to no good. An accelerometer is what's used to detect how you're moving around in conjunction, for example, with GPS. And what I've discovered is that when I'm looking at the phone, um, if I'm on the, the tramway, um, once I go beyond about five or six kilometers per hour, it stops, it says, oh no, no walking, <laughs> you're traveling at too, too much speed. If I go on my bicycle, the same thing. So an accelerometer works in a very, very simple way. Most sensors work in very, very simple ways. And the way this works simply is, you've got, and these things work on a microscopic level, by the way. They're tiny, okay? But this just explains it. We start off with a little weight, and it's got a spring attached. Now the spring could be as simple as a little tiny piece of lightweight plastic shaped like a V on its side. And that's actually what a lot of them do look like, okay? So the mass 
bounces against the spring, and depending on the proximity or the speed of the mass moving, this sends a signal back in and it tells you how fast you're accelerating. It's that simple. This one here is a pressure sensor. How do I know when I come across here and I stand on that thing that I have stood on it? Well, there's a positive and a negative. There's two plates. We squeeze them together and the circuit is made. It's the same as saying API on, API off. It's that simple, okay? So hardware sensors, they're not things that we need to be afraid of. Um, and this here is an example of uh, some code in Python that shows us how to connect using a library. And the internet is cool because there is all sorts of free stuff out there, including GPO libraries for Python. And we can do simple things like a file object means open a device file for read. Read all lines, close it. Like, how many times have we done this as engineers and developers and programmers reading a file from a, uh, a hard drive, you know? It's exactly the same thing. We just open to a device rather than to a file. It's the same type of stuff. So the lesson here is that things are the same and just slightly different. So how do we move our bot? <laughs> how do we move this guy around? There's different ways. Um, and if, you're, if you've ever heard of, um, uh, what's that crowd? Um, Boston, Robo Boston Robotics, is that the name of them? Yeah, Boston Robotics. Um, and you've seen those scary um, dogs and stuff they have, and back carriers and everything else. Um, there's all sorts of ways to move things. We can use wheels, pods, skates, caterpillars. Um, yesterday I saw an incredibly scary snake. And it wasn't in Poland, it was on the internet. Because <laughs> we know there's no snakes in Poland, right? <laughs> there's no snakes in Ireland either, because St. Patrick hunted those out years ago. <laughs> um, if you want to see something interesting on a snake in robotics, and write this one down or put it in your phone or even Google it up right now, look up the um, power charger for the new Tesla um, uh, electric car. It's absolutely scary shit. It's like everything from your worst nightmares come together in one little four second video. It's just this mechanical snake thing that comes out and you're going, it's definitely going to eat me. <laughs> it is. But actually it just finds automatically the hole and sticks itself in and charges the car. It's incredibly cool. But it's all done using small little sensors, just like this. You know, there's nothing that is magic about this. And that's the message I'm really going to cross there. This is simple stuff and we need to just cross this boundary. So, for moving, the trick here is that it's all about the servos. We can do fancy stuff with magnetics and um, lines and wires and hydraulics, but ultimately it's usually down to little servos, even tiny, tiny, tiny micro little buggers that are there and are used, and they're very useful. So, um, I messed around for a while with Meccanum wheels. And Meccanum wheels are interesting because um, Michael Jackson, right? So everybody's seen Michael Jackson and he's doing these cool dance moves, right? And he moves to the side, yeah? And he can move back and forth. But he does this side shuffle thing. And if I embarrass myself doing this, I'll never live it down, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I did it when I was 20 years ago, I'm not going to do it now. But to move sideways in a robot is actually quite difficult. So someone came up with this idea of taking a wheel turning it slightly sideways and splitting it down the center and then putting two little servers on it. And the idea is that if you push it with enough sideways force, it'll actually move sideways because of the angle of the wheels. And that's exactly what a mechanum wheel does. So I'll just zoom in on it there slightly. Okay, so we can see that if we put force on the top, it moves sideways. If we put force downwards, it moves backwards. And um, if we put force on a corner and another side, we can make it turn around. So frightfully interesting stuff. But is it useful? Zenbo is now selling quite nicely, thank you very much. And they aren't using the cannon wheels. <laughs> but as engineers, one of the things that we do frequently is they say, yeah, but this is cool. <laughs> this is really cool, and I want to do it, and I want to use it. Don't. 
Keep it simple. Keep it simple, because if you don't keep it simple, you'll never finish the damn thing, and it'll just become another media center sitting with your 18 Raspberry Pis on your desk. So it's important to keep things simple so you can get to a version one. So this is actually the start of my robot at the moment, and um, it's using two simple wheels at the back, a Pi in the center, and a little ball bearing on the front. So I can just tweak left and right, and it'll move exactly where I want, backwards, forwards, and in circles, etc. Um, so this is just, again, another thing. It, what was that movie um, that the guy was standing on the thing, he was doing this? It's the, the Karate Kid. Remember the Karate Kid movie? Right. So this is a robot doing the Karate Kid move. Look. Ha! Wax on, wax off! That's cool, but why? <laughs> now sometimes it's okay to do cool, but why? Because it leads to other things. But don't spend all your time doing cool, but why? Okay, so um, the next thing that's important to note about uh, building your own robot is how it interfaces with the world. There is a chap in Japan, I can't remember his name, um, he is one of these two gentlemen sitting here in black, and he's a professor of robotics, and his particular goal is to do his best to make his robot look just like a human, and behave just like a human. And he's getting scarily close. So the days of Terminator are getting closer and closer. <laughs> so look beside the person beside you now, and look beside the person beside you in five years' time, and if they look the same, leave. <laughs> so, the thing is, with robots, um, we've discovered through um, uh, a lot of psychology testing that um, there's a thing called Uncanny Valley. And what happens in Uncanny Valley, it's, it's like this, so a valley is like this, right? And the idea is, is that, um, you know, when you're looking at something or you're observing something and you're kind of going, it just doesn't feel quite right. It's just something that feels wrong. You can't quite go, that's what it is, but you know there's something not quite right. It's just mm, in your head. That's called uncanny valley, when it gets us that little bit close to something that is troubling. So when a robot looks and acts too much like a human, we actually rebel against it. This is interesting from a development point of view because these guys over here, with their little simple tablet face that go and they make squeaky noises and stuff, they're cute and they're cool. So Terminator wasn't cute and cool. Wally was cute and cool. <laughs> yeah? So, um, and Disney know this. <laughs> so, um, when you're doing it, it's critically important, not only from a robotics point of view, but from a general engineering design point of view, to make sure that your UI is very, very user friendly. At the end of the day, if you have two products, so any of you guys were hoping or are doing a startup, okay? I'll tell you here and now, um, engineering is only part of your problem. UI, if you're facing a user, is your biggest problem. With two technologies of equal value and functionality. Even if one in the background is far, far technically superior, the one that will win is the one that has the better user interface. That is guaranteed, it has been proven time and time and time again. So always bear that in mind when you're designing stuff. Okay, so to look around, um, I talked about the pan and tilt before. Um, I unfortunately, by the way, um, uh, left the box with uh, Zenbo Jr., as he's affectionately called, or Zenbo Riboff, as my partner calls him, um, back in Dublin. Um, but you would actually see the, the different bits and I could have controlled it. Um, but what I have is, um, I have him on his uh, set of wheels, and he has a camera on top that moves around, and I have, uh, uh, I actually have three Raspberry Pis on the one thing to offload and distribute, but we'll talk about it in a second. Um, 
and uh, the camera moves and detects people and movement, okay? And I didn't do that myself. I went out and I found some open source Python code that does it for me. So there's actually very little code that I have actually written myself bar stitching things together, yeah? So a lot of times, and part of the lesson here as well is, a lot of times when we go as engineers to do something, it's not necessarily our jobs to do something new. It's our job to do whatever is optimal for the project that we're doing, okay? So don't go out trying to reinvent the wheel all the time. See what's there and see can you reuse it. That's critically important. So I said that um, I have actually three Raspberry Pis on my robot. And I have one main, I have one Pi Zero, and then I have what's called an OpenMV. So I'm using a library called OpenCV for image detection and recognition. And I found that when I was trying to move the robot, do image detection, connect to the back end um, Lewis and Cortana intelligence service in Microsoft, and do 10 or 12 other things, it was just getting slow. It wasn't working. So what I did was I said, mm, okay, well, this stuff is still cheap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a few of them. So I have one Pi and I offload the image processing to it because that's quite heavy. I have another one that does the main motoring stuff. And I have a third one that does little analytics and finding out where it is and that kind of stuff. Okay? So the message here is that um, always spread your load. Never try and scale up. Think about spreading out instead. So interacting. Um, the way that I interact with humans is I have a voice. I'm using a, a, a JavaScript library called Jasper. Um, and I'm hooking in with that with voice recognition. Um, and I'm sending what I get back up to Lewis, which is the Microsoft um, interactive service. So I can say to Lewis something like, uh, um, what is the weather today? Mm, well, it does what's called natural language processing. And it breaks out those words, what? OK, so what is the question? Um, whether it knows that that's a, an entity. And then Dublin is a place. So it looks up whether Dublin API and gives me back the thing. Or I can say, um, what's the weather going to be like next week? Now, if I have it hooked into my diary, it knows that next week, which is this week, I'm in Poland. So it'll say, hmm, the location is actually Poland. So it'll go and pick it up there and snap it back in. So I use Lewis on the back end for natural language processing and for parsing that back. It comes back to me in a JSON um, feed, and then I can display what I want on the screen. So a robot walks into a bar. We've had lots of jokes about people and a priest walks into a bar or a, uh, a queen walks into a bar. This one is a robot walks into a bar. And the interesting question about a robot walks into a bar is, how does this work? Like, let's, let's think about this a second. So you, as a human, go into a place you've never been before. How do you orientate yourself? How do you know where something is? How do you know that, oh, I look over here, there's two, three, three things that look like doors, probably into something else, and there's an object here I don't want to bump into, it's got a corner on it. There's something here that seems to have wheels, I better not trip over. How do you move around? How do you judge where you can go? How do you do this type of thing? How do you know the height of different things? So we go back to sensors again. And we can use our sensors to help us judge um, by sending out a sonic signal of distance to myself and this bag. We can use it to um, help us know if there's a face stand still as a movement in the area. So the critical part here is um, how do I pull together my environment and understand what I'm doing? And the way we do it is using a technique called SLAM. And SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And you can get an idea, um, I'll zoom in again on that main map. Okay, so you can get an idea even by looking at that. You're intelligent people and you can tell roughly what's going on. So we start off and um, uh, we create a matrix uh, in an array in memory. 
um, and we say, okay, I effectively open the door, I'm the robot, I walk into a bar, and I have a matrix in front of me. And then I start measuring and looking. And I use different devices. I use my proximity device, I use my um, sensor, I use my movement device, and I use my OpenCV library as well to tell me what's there and can I detect objects and what distance is that object from me. I have my sensor on a pan and tilt, so if there's something that's interesting, I can point out and I can measure the distance. So the mapping here allows me to carefully move forward, discover something. If I'm blocked, I move back out again, I turn, I go to the next area. This is how we autonomously map and find things out. So over here, we have areas that I tried to get in and for some reason, maybe I could see through a window, but when I went up near to it, I was blocked because of the wall in the way. Um, back over here, um, we can see clear movement boundaries. So it's reasonable to think that we can put together in code pretty easily by just having inputs and outputs a method for mapping an area. It's not that complex, okay? This is not rocket science. So these are some of the things that I'm using. I'm using an open MV camera, um, PIR motion to tell me if something is moving in the room because I don't want to walk into the family dog. Um, and an obstacle avoidance, which is a, 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 a sonic thing. All right, so um, warbirds and log files. Warbirds and log files. What could they possibly have in common? What we don't know matters. In engineering, what we don't know matters a huge amount. So this guy here called Abraham, and he was a mathematician. And in the Second World War, he was brought in to um, uh, the RAF, and his job was to discover, using statistics, tell us why is it that all of our aircraft are coming back in and we're losing so many. And if you can tell us why are we losing so many aircraft, can you tell us what can we do to help us lose less aircraft? How can we make this a more efficient process? It's just an engineering problem, right? This is all it is. So the common wisdom at the time was, um, they went away, and I'm going to just zoom in here again. They went away, and they created a simple drawing of the aircraft. And every single time an aircraft came back in, the maintenance technicians would go out with a bit of paper and they would put a dot, a mark, onto the map exactly where, um, if anybody wants their photograph taken, there's a guy here with a cool camera, so they would put a dot onto the map of where the bullets had hit the plane. And if you look at this image here, all the black, that's actually hundreds and thousands of dots. <laughs> hundreds and thousands of dots. The thing just got completely black. So the common wisdom was, ah, what we need to do is we need to put more steel on the wings and on the nose and all the way down the back of the fuselage, on the tail fins, and in fact, every place except the white parts. That was the common thinking. And that would make sense, right? Except it doesn't. He turned this on his head. And he said, no, what we're seeing is, we're seeing aircraft that have come back. They are successful. And they have holes and bullet holes all around here. But the ones that don't have um, any marks, they didn't come back. So that's where we need to put the steel. So it's really, really important to be aware of what we don't know in engineering. And this is why, especially in something like robotics, we should keep logs. Logs are absolutely vital. You know, it's the same as um, uh, um, when we have a, a website, we've got some kind of service up in the cloud, and something goes wrong. So I say, no problem. You put on your superhero pants, you put on your big S, you fly into the rescue, you jump into the code, you make the chain, bang! Suddenly, across the entire website, the entire service, everything is working fine, yeah? 
doesn't work like that in things that aren't connected. So for example, a robot is out in the wild, or a mobile phone. So whenever you're doing mobile development, also think, I need to keep logs, and I need to analyze them afterwards. Very important. OK, so um, as you're going along, it's very important to keep reviewing what you're doing. Has anybody ever seen this particular thing about project management, right? It's a very old one. It's been around for years and years and years. But it's very true. Um, this one says, this first one is, this is what the customer wanted. The second one said, this is how the project manager understood what the customer wanted. This is how the analyst designed it. This is how the programmer wrote it. All the way down to, this is how we build the customer. And this is what they really wanted. That rubber tire is the most singular important part. We should only be interested in what the customer wants. Now sure, Steve Jobs will tell us, or he would if he wasn't dead, <laughs> he would tell us that sometimes the customer doesn't know what they want and you have to tell them. But they're actually exceptional circumstances. Most of the time we need to do that. So keep checking in with the customer, that's really important. Um, the current project status if you could see my desk, it's like this with about 100 other bits on it, um, and it's in different parts. And the most important thing to understand from this is that uh, you don't go and take a project on and just um, attack it all at once. It's really important to decompose down into the little small steps and solve small problems and then pull them together into one big solution. There's a joke that says, how do you eat an elephant? An elephant's a big thing, right? <laughs> it's pretty huge. So how in the name of Christ would you eat an elephant? Well, the answer is one bite at a time. <laughs> it's that simple. So it's the same with large and complex pro uh, projects. Um, you break things down into small um, pieces. Um, OK, so um, the, the other lesson here is that um, when you present something to somebody, you present a finished product, a finished piece of engineering work to somebody, um, you don't think to yourself, um, oh, well, it's sensors, it's this, it's that, it's the other, it's um, facial recognition, it is mobile, it's servos, it's Lewis, it's wonderful scientific things like this. It's a robot, guys. Okay? So when you build it, it is more than the sum of its parts and you've got to give it that respect, you've got to learn from it, um, because all of these different things came to make this one thing today. So, who is this? Hand up. Okay. You get hen's teeth, <laughs> Raspberry Pi Zero. So, um, this guy said that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. And this is, how many people have heard um, of the thing, um, uh, look at this person here, they always use the same tool to solve the same problem. Yeah, so um, there was a guy I used to work with and um, he only knew one thing, and that was SQL. Now, he was brilliant at SQL. I mean, he was insanely brilliant at SQL. But this is all he knew how to do. And every single problem that we would bring up as a team, he would say, we can do this in SQL. <laughs> we all know this guy or this girl, right? The thing is, is that we need to constantly be looking into new areas. We constantly be needing to um, read, or read into new fields as engineers. We need to constantly um, reinvent ourselves. And we need to constantly keep pushing ourselves on and learning new stuff. When I started off my robotics journey, I started off with thinking, I can never do this. I'm a software guy. <laughs> and now I have, sure, it's still in bits, but with maybe a, a week of work when I have nothing to do at Christmas, um, I'll have this little cute guy running around the house um, who actually has done nothing more than cost me about I don't know, a couple of hundred hours in research and about two or three hundred dollars in, in parts. Um, but the most important part, thing is, is that I've moved on, my thinking has moved on, my learning has moved on, 
um, and uh, I've learned some new skills in the process. I've learned how to solder. I've learned how to pull cables together. Um, I've learned how to blow up a Raspberry Pi. It's quite easy. If you put the polarity the wrong way, you blow things up. Yeah. Um, so uh, the message here is that what you should do is you should experiment and you should keep learning. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you guys very much for coming. Um, hopefully you get something small out of it and out of the other speakers you're going to see today. Um, I'm putting together uh, a couple of different um, uh, tutorials and uh, videos and things on um, this and other things related to uh, machine learning, robotics, and um, uh, bots on the web. So if you're interested in that, ping me on Twitter and just send the word bot, and I'll, when I publish then in Q1, I'll send you a link for those there as well, and they'll be free out, so just so as you have them. Okay, thank you very much.